Maria. Uh, okay. So, if you've been watching the playthroughs, you know my big gripe about this one. This is an incredibly interesting um, system <coughs> with a lot of tension. Um, the three player aspect, there aren't a lot of really good three player games, and this seems to provide that experience in a, a, a flexible, dynamic uh, sort of way where you're making these really hard choices playing one player off the others, and uh, you have a fair amount of, you know, historical background going on and everything. Um, the things that happen on the board from the 30,000 foot view appear <coughs> to be fairly believable. But when you dive down into what's happening in the game, these regular deck, not quite regular, decks of cards, and the way that they're used in this system, and it's the same in Frederick, uh, even though I don't really remember it, but it has, I haven't played it, but I've looked at the rules, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but my understanding is it uses the same basic combat and movement system in the card relationship. Well, you'll have heard most of my complaints about the cards. They are almost a deal breaker in, in my case for this game. Um, because basically they associate uh, your core decisions with something that goes beyond what CDGs sort of postulate, which is, you know, maybe you're like a god who's kind of smiling over the fate of your army and might throw a weather storm <laughs> to support things. Yeah, I know there's other ways to try to interpret that. <clears throat> I don't believe them because I believe that someone is making a, a, a decision in a CDG someone associated with that side is making a decision that, yeah, we don't need reinforcements and we don't need to move with this good card instead, what, or not so good card or whatever. Instead, we're going to use it uh, to have bad weather for the battle. What's it supposed to mean? Hey, better, uh, better raincoats and, you know, <laughs> weather balloons or something? I, I, I have no idea what the investment is supposed to represent. Um, but the reality is that's what it feels like, especially <coughs> especially for where you can't justify, yeah, there's a weather service in play, <laughs> you know. Um, and there are a number of cards like that in the CDGs. Now, in this, you're dealing in a plane that is just completely different. Um, you're holding a handful of cards making operational scale decisions as to where to stand and fight. Um, where to position your army over a fairly decent sized space of ground, one of these big squares. Uh, well, one of these squares versus one of its surrounding, you know. So you might have the choice, hey, I could defend here or here or here. Well, I can't defend here because I don't have any hearts in my hand, so we'll throw back to here because I have some good spades, whatever. <coughs> there are other factors that kind of weigh into this, too. Um, the fact that the amount of troops that you have in a battle, in an individual battle, is less important than the cards that you have. And I just can't square the circle on what all that means. And I say almost a deal breaker. The only reason it's not is because the gameplay in this is so damn compelling. And somehow, because that 30,000 foot view looks pretty decent, Unlike, say, Struggle of Empires, where the 30,000 foot view looks like crap, I, I, I'm seeing, you know, a slightly more complicated risk game being played out, you know, in a seven years war, well, in an Age of Reason setting. About the same time as this. Um, and honestly, even Soldier King, which uh, plays in that same era, both of these play on kind of a global view, um, Soldier King's mechanisms are kind of desperately unbelievable. In, in terms of how simplistic they, they operate and kind of wrong. Um, that combination 
usually just really turns me off. Here, what we've got is something that seems to be telling pretty much the proper story. It stays within reasonable historical bounds just because of, you know, there's a, there's the event cards, which you have to purchase politically, the political event cards, um, which I summarized here, and they, um, they help. There's just also uh, the way the forces are balanced in terms of the number of cards that you get, because the cards are your resources in the game. <coughs> um, but there's something very exciting about the actual gameplay, the bluffing elements, um, uh, the level of decision making that you have, the tension that arises from all of that. All that I think works very, very well. You see me playing it in the worst of possible situations, the point where I am the most critical of the historical aspect of a game when I do these videos. If I was playing it opposed, I might not much notice the history. Um, I'm sure this would come up and it would bug me and I'd be like, that's pretty damn ridiculous, you know? <laughs> um, but I kind of find that funny in a lot of games when something silly and stupid happens in it. <coughs> um, when something silly and stupid is the core of the rules, though, that kind of makes me feel like I'm not playing... Um, well, it makes me feel like I'm playing a Euro or something, right? I'm playing a game that happens to have a historical um, uh, connection. And I don't get upset when there's no pretension, but I feel like here... There's not just a pretension, there's a serious attempt to try to make something that's kind of like a war game with this poison pill in it that says, this is no simulation. Therefore, to my, you know, categorization, it cannot be a war game because it's not making any attempt to simulate the um, key military aspects of maneuver and combat and the operational decisions as to where you're going to fight and, you know, how, how, how you're going to pursue your, your, your strategic goals. Are, are completely in the hands of the cards that you play. Even to the extent where like your political choices are linked into those cards. So these same cards that you use for making choices on the battlefield, uh, you're also making choices on um, as to which suit perhaps one player gets to choose this is the applicable suit for political cards and bidding on those. <coughs> And again, the, the link just doesn't really work. It's like, yeah, uh, I love this, but I wouldn't be able to fight at Nancy, but I would be able to fight at Metz because of some political operations I took in the Italian peninsula, uh, or maybe um, actually at the same time it might have also been... Um, in Prussian-Russian relationship. I, it's just like, what? <laughs> My mind is just exploding with the kind of uh, connections that these cards imply. Um, another thing you might look at is these cards, compare them to, say, a couple of the CDGs that I really hate the mechanism for, which is the battle card mechanism in We the People or in... Um, <coughs> Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. In those games, uh, you didn't have foreknowledge with your battles. And that was kind of the difference. And that's kind of an important difference. Because what it meant was, you just handed this random little hand of cards, and now you've got to play it out, and you can kind of try to trick your opponent within that uh, hand of cards for a brief period of time, but here, the fact that they are tied, everything that poisons the historical simulation side for me, makes this a really, really intriguing game, where, you know, a move on the board is affecting my potential political capabilities, it's affecting uh, battles on other sides of the board, all that stuff that I really despise is actually making it really interesting. So there's like this, this competitive, uh, uh, struggle between the historicity of the game and the um, the particular uh, uh, the particular enjoyment that I feel this game provides. 
And I think if you look at it as a game and as nothing else, uh, it's a pretty damn cool game. If you look at it as a historical simulation, uh, it's horrible. Not because of the outcome, which is believable, nor even the intermediate outcomes, which are believable, but rather because of the input going in is so tainted by these damn cards. And if that doesn't bother you, <coughs> well, you know, this is definitely a game you'd like. Okay. Um, was there more I wanted to particularly say? I mean, there is a real excitement to that, to the way the cards uh, operate in this. Uh, oh, yeah. So I've got this, uh, in addition to sort of the baseline on the cards, there's another aspect. And, you know, if you really want to hear my views on these things, you got to watch the full playthrough because I, so much uh, is tainted by this. But um, there's the feeling, although I know I can't do it, that there's card counting capabilities and decisions that you make based not just on counting the cards and understanding them, which uh, maybe I can view, but in terms of trying to trigger which deck is the next deck. And from anything other than a I can't shuffle a huge deck of cards perspective, the only design decision that I can understand for why they separated it into four decks the way they did, or the way the designer did, is to promote that card counting. Now, there's two aspects to that. One is, I'm not sure any human's capable of doing that card counting. <laughs> I know I'm not. And the second is, <clears throat> it seems particularly, again, unrepresentative of anything. Um, but if you do happen to have some sort of uh, atavistic, you know, power to be aware of exactly what all the cards that have been played more or less are, uh, or at least a good feel for from each different color deck, uh, I think maybe there's some room for you to make some kinds of strategy decisions that are just really kind of outside the realm, and they're more in the lines of, you know, the card counting procedures that you use in some other games, and it just doesn't seem to have a link to anything here. Okay, what about components? Let's just talk about that. Um, we got your little wooden circles and cubes. There aren't a lot of them. Uh, that makes it a little easier for stickering, at least. Um, but it also means there aren't a lot of things you have to deal with on the board at once, which is important because there's a fair amount of <coughs> thought that goes into the moving of each piece. The counters are, are fine wooden pieces. Hey, they seem to work pretty well. The cards themselves are quite pretty. Uh, if you watch through the play, they've got some nice images on them. You know, it's a custom deck, runs from 2 to 10, with some wild card cards. You've got player aid cards, you've got the historical cards in here. Um, you've got player aid cards in both uh, English and German. This little thing which is barely readable. The map, which is kind of gorgeous. Um, it really looks pretty when it's set up. And what you never saw was the back of the map which shows the map in kind of a reduced version with, uh, let's see if I can do this, that special angle between um, the two maps because they're laid out not, you know, in a fully, not in a perfectly geographic, geometrical geographic locations. You got these little sheets that you keep track of the armies on. Um, the way I do it is kind of unpleasant, the way you're supposed to do it. Looks like it wouldn't be a problem at all with each player having their own. The only questionable thing is there's a hidden trackable information in terms of the potential victory points. The rules, mm, they're not, I seem to say this about everything, but they're not presented quite how I would like them to be. Uh, I found them uh, difficult to look things up in, uh, a little bit of scattering, and not enough cross-referencing, not, uh, not enough access to things. Um, space that could have been used for numbering is being used to put uh, parts on <laughs> in every single space. Uh, there is some numbering, but yeah, uh, each individual point is, is handled 
in the same structural format as if it were a, a strong case system, almost an Avalon Hill case system with the size of the little paragraphs that there are, but there's no linking into them, so they become useless. Uh, they're all the same. They don't even differentiate. If they alternated the suits, that would help me. Uh, okay, what, what about the actual aspects of, of the rules? Um, the setup puts you in a position a very historical position where Prussia is sort of getting the jump on everybody leaping into Silesia, but the bigger powers like uh, France and Austria are going to eventually build up their army uh, decks and, and be kind of powerful. Um, I had the advantage of actually having a discussion about this game uh, across a couple of threads on BGG. This is something I'm not used to doing anymore, and I miss the hell out of doing it. This is, you know, how I got motivated to do this one and with my site pretty much turned into a garbage dumpster by you know pretty much one user but i didn't help things by being an asshole myself and uh, making it clear that i wasn't gonna bend on free speech uh, <laughs> to shut one user down uh, but now it's just you know it's just a trash bin other than the individual fora where people can put their own materials. Um, but anyway, yeah. I, if I thought I could, like, hang out at BGG the way I really felt like I needed to, it would be a really cool thing, but they're never going to lighten up. and you know, They're going to always see any, anything, any lashing out or anything, even in fun in play, as, as it has been in some cases, as just, nope, can't do that. Get out of here, and you're gone for, you know, however long they decide to throw you out for, which is not based on the offense, but rather the new number of times you've gotten a warning. Um, okay, and it, it's just something I, I, I can't invest in because I will get screwed over by it if I do. Um, so what about... Um, uh, the sequence of play is set up uh, so that it's hard to tell who has the advantage, but it's always done in a certain order, just like an I go, you go game, but in a three-player game that feels a little bit more um, a little bit more disturbing than otherwise. But it is set up in a way that the Austrians can use their hussars. If somebody's a little careless on their own turn, uh, the Austrians can move and possibly further than you think they can using a forced march or something. And then on their, uh, before you get to move again, they get to slap their hussars down at the beginning of the turn and screw up your uh, supply status, which can be kind of painful. And it can actually halt your advance. Well, it will halt your advance in terms of capturing stuff. <coughs> um, players get different amounts of tactical cards, like I said, and that uh, changes things over. Supply is one of the more... Uh, I thought it was more realistic than I'm feeling that it is in this game, uh, yeah, the, uh, this play of it. Um, I feel primarily the thing that bugs me is the fact that your supply lines are of unlimited length. Uh, basically, if you draw your supply wagon with you and keep it kind of close to your armies, you can be as deep in enemy territory as you like. Uh, but you cannot um, if you get cut off from your supply wagon <coughs> you're out of supply when you're inside enemy territory well it almost gets it my feeling is that each player should have more supply things and you should have to trace from supply thing to supply thing um, that you should and trace all the way back to your home sort of a la an empires and arms type of uh, supply nature where it, there is a cost to maintaining a long supply line and it's similar to the cost to maintaining a broad set of uh, supply points uh, moving forward. Um, so I think something that was a little closer to trace supply would probably make sense here. Uh, the movement, uh, the force marches along the roads, I think they're appropriate, 
but they're hard. It, it's very hard to see just how far somebody can leap forward uh, in terms of those. I, I guess with more plays, you'd get more used to it, but I found it sometimes very uh, disconcerting to see, and especially with the Austrians throwing themselves in and then, oh, wow, my supply just got cut. <coughs> um, which means, for the supply side, as long as you stay connected to your supply wagon, and the nice factor of that is you move very slowly when that happens. That's the positive part of it. Um, as long as you stay really close to your supply wagon, like with everyone in space, you probably can't be cut off from supply unless somebody can move into your supply wagon and destroy it. And there's a cost to you for that happening. Um, the way fortresses are handled in this, and this is not the same as Friedrich, it, like I know Friedrich, but I have the rules differences here in this one, um, is you walk over a fortress, you conquer. If you start on a fortress and move away from it, you conquer. The exceptions are if you're out of supply, maybe I'm missing some here, but um, that's one of the big ones. And the other big one is if the enemy is within three spaces of the fortress. If he has forces operating in that area, you don't get a cheap siege. And there's no other answer. Uh, you have to drive those enemy um, harassing forces out of the way. Is that exactly realistic? No, but it's a pretty good approximation of the realism. Um, <clears throat> sieges work it, it basically puts the onus on the wrong person it, is I guess the negative side to it which is if you look at something like the siege of Lille Marlborough's need yeah, I should pick something closer to the age of reason but uh, or to the, at least this part of it um, but it, it, it's very similar in, in, in theory basically you settled down and it took time to take a siege and you had a covering army and you had uh, a screening army. And the screening army was there to prevent the enemy from interfering with your siege and preventing it from happening. Well, that put the onus of the attack on the person trying to relieve the siege. And that's the only difference here. There's not a tremendous uh, disadvantage to attacking. So that's not too big a deal. Combat is a combination of the strength of your units and the cards you hold. If your hand of cards is pretty small, the number of strength points you have becomes pretty important. If you have big hands of cards, though, the actual sizes of the armies stop seeming to mean anything, and that's completely unrealistic. Therefore, the only way to kind of try to understand what's going on here is to say cards don't, uh, that the strength of the armies doesn't represent the actual strength of the army. It represents something, and I don't know what the fuck it is. <laughs> and the cards have to somehow represent the actual amount of troops there as well in some sort of combination. But that number of troops is you're actually buying troops with cards, so they don't really rep and I'm just, again, head explodes when trying to figure out what the fuck those cards and the way they interact with the combat system. Um, uh, now, um, there was something else. My brain flutters by stuff so easily. Uh, one of the cool things with the Fortress Conquest system is if you drive over a fortress and then attack the enemy and drive him out of range where he's you know, preventing you from taking the fortress, you get a little question mark as you go over the fortress. If you drive the enemy away in that time, you conquer the fortress. So again, that kind of makes up for a little bit of the, uh, I've got the wrong person making the attack here. Um, winter time, you're basically able to rebuild your troops and you're paying, again, those same cards. Here it doesn't bother me. Uh, what bothers me is the suits and the amount of influence that the cards have. So if you have a large hand of cards, you have more of your firepower based on the troops. Now, the one thing with the troops is the troops are there for every battle until they're not. <laughs> you know, uh, Once you lose a battle, you're going to lose your troops. So as long as you can keep winning, Troops are more valuable than cards, perhaps, or I don't know. It costs you four points to build a unit of troops, and 
so troops are more valuable than that four points. Uh, let me think. No. Uh, <laughs> troops are more valuable than one point on the card. That's clear. But are they worth that four point expenditure? Well, that comes down to a, it depends, right? Troops work anywhere. They, they're not suited by, they're not uh, uh, affected by the suiting and all kind of stuff like that. So there's sort of a, a weird calculus going on in your head trying to figure out uh, how many actual troop strength points you want to have. And each of your armies is limited to the number. Another big factor about troops is if an army is completely wiped out, that takes away your capability to move that army around and do stuff with it. So you don't want like a one or two strength point army operating on its own. It's too easy to knock out of the game. You know, it can come back, but it's too easy to knock out your, your full capability down in that area. On the other hand, at four pips per unit, there's a high expense to building up those extra units. So it's kind of a... Um, I'm not going to talk about the introductory game. We didn't play it. I barely understand it. You have a number of things that you want to do that give you kind of uh, victory points. So victory is going to be determined largely. You have a pool of victory points that you have to get rid of. And you get rid of them by conquering enemy fortresses, but you'll also get rid of them by winning battles, by achieving certain goals. So like if you're able to get the Italy track to a certain point, you might be able to get a victory point there. If you're able to get three of the Rhine electors, you get a victory point that way. If you get elected emperor, which is having the majority of the electors, of, of the electors uh, vote for you, you get a point. Now it's a cool point because it can't be taken away as <clears throat> Same with the Prussian Silesia point. The way the politics works, everybody basically gets to play one card and out of that same hand of combat cards, resources, whatever you want to call them. And the choice of suit and everything is again linked to the battlefield at the same time that it's linked to your politics. And again, head explodes when you start trying to look at it too carefully because it just doesn't make any sense. It's almost like, it's almost like this is a world described by an abstract algebra, you know, that's just completely, it contains some similarities in some aspects, and then has some things that just don't work. Like, you know, maybe you count to 10 and then you wrap around, you, you count to nine and 10 is zero, and then you start back over again. And, you know, so addition becomes not necessarily always a positive thing or whatever. It's, it's that kind of world, you know, <laughs> where it's just so divorced from any kind of reality that it stops, it, it just becomes a game model. Um, you have a couple of special rules to handle political considerations, which add a little bit of the, a fair amount to kind of the historical feel of the game. Um, players are allowed to negotiate and cut some deals. They're also allowed to provide subsidies to other powers. Now, yeah, only to allied powers. You have this weird situation of a schizophrenic player, which is the Prussian player in the three-player game, which the game is really designed for three, ends up playing also the English, the Anglo-Dutch uh, forces. And they're on different sides in this war. So it feels kind of weird, but you're not trying to help France win the game. And France is the enemy of the Anglo-Dutch. Austria is the enemy of the Prussians. And there really isn't a lot they can do to help each other. What they can is on the political stage, and it's not too unbelievable, um, because usually it's Anglo-Dutch activities that might help Prussia. And when you consider that England switched sides between here and the Seven Years' War, and they were constantly playing the balance of power politics in Europe, it would not be unreasonable to um, see the Anglo-Dutch favoring a strong Prussia uh, in exchange for trying to pull Prussia out of the uh, French orbit. Although, honestly, I would rather have Austria in my orbit. They're clearly, overall, the stronger power. Um, 
that switch of of sides is one of the weirdest things, and that that's one of the few things modeled in, in uh, struggle of <coughs> struggle of nations, struggle of nations, I think. Empires, I don't know which ones are true. Anyway, uh, I highly recommend this as a game. I say if you're looking at it as some kind of simulation of military operations, i.e., a war game. This isn't the right thing for you. What this is, is this is a war-themed game, but one where the war theming is done much, much better than in your average uh, Ameritrash or, or uh, Wuro type thing. Anyway, that's my feelings on it. Up it goes. <laughs>